Uh, next up, Jay Turler. Jay is our in-house. He, he's, he runs a team at Bug Crowd. He's our in-house hardware, mind-blowing guru. Um, he does, you know, if you, if you participate to a car hacking program, you're going to deal with Jay at some point. He has spoken at Nalcon and has this amazing wealth of knowledge on this subject. Um, and personally, just having experience with what he can do, I'm really excited for this. I think it's going to be a great talk. And uh, take it away, Jay. Hello. Uh, thanks, Michael, for introducing me. I'm so excited to talk about um, this topic. And um, let me just share my screen right now. And by the way, I'm sorry for the background noise. It's currently 6 a.m. here in the Philippines. So that's why you can hear the roosters crowing right now. My apologies for that. So, yeah. Just a note, we can't see the screen yet as well. It yeah. just needs to be, gotcha. Sorry. Yep. And, also, and good to go. The rooster is amazing. <laughs> yeah total pot total plus <laughs> yep so my topic is automotive security bugs explained for bug hunters version 2.0 and um the reason the reason why it's 2.0 is because i've already actually um, presented this at nalcon but the reason why it's 2.0 is that uh i've revamped the slides and also added other tools and also other information about automotive security bugs. And this presentation is actually gonna, gonna give you a perspective on how we look on bugs based on a car hacking uh, program or a bug bash. So I'm actually using the car hacking village logo as well because I got involved with the car hacking village as well here in the Philippines and also with the folks that I've met in DEF CON. Uh, Car Hacking Village is like a Disneyland for me and also DEF CON as well. So who am I? I'm Jay Thurla, that's my Twitter handle and in RootCon they call me Jetman. And um, basically I'm a security ops manager for a bug crowd and I handle the ASE team here in the Philippines. Uh, I'm also a Rootcon Goon and a CFP reviewer. I'm not the author of Turla Malware. I've received this DMs in Twitter like 2013 or 2012 before, but I just tell them that no, I'm not even Russian, I'm Filipino. So, And like I said, um, I've also helped develop uh, Metasploit modules or contribute to Metasploit uh, modules. And in fact, last year, I've actually pushed a, uh, a module related to car hacking. And you can also see me at hacker conferences and also, you know, any virtual conference right now since COVID. So here it goes. Um, this is actually the... Uh, the car first car hacking village in Rootcon, and um, you know, this was last year, and we actually uh, taught the people or some attendees how to read the can. Uh, I mean, how to do can sniffing, can in the middle attacks, uh, can floods, and how to fuzz a real hardware with simulators and um, instrument clusters. And also we have an actual ECU simulator that is hardware based. And through my friends, Aaron Money and Nickel Bogam, we were able to uh, show the attendees how an anomaly detection system works, which, uh, which is a kind of a system that allows you to detect if someone is like spoofing messages or sending malicious messages. It's really cool. So. Anyway, well, why car hacking? I mean, I, I think most of you have have some questions about this. Basically, it's a fun community. Car Hacking Village has been gi giving a lot of information, tutorials about car hacking, um, how to open, uh, how to use uh, devices for sniffing the can, and also like 
you know, they also have a CTF like events where they pay, pay uh, I mean, they reward hackers uh, with actual Tesla cars or even, you know, black badges as well. And because we use it every day, we want to ensure that we are actually safe uh, from attack. So that's why I have some, you know, interest in car hacking. And there are actually a lot of attack surfaces for cars. So I will discuss on that later on. And then if Bug Crowd says that my other computer is your computer, it's basically my uh, my other computer is your car's computer because it has uh, IVI or it has Linux boxes like um, infotainment systems and telematics. So there's some computers on it. And then from my experience of car hacking, bug bashes pay well. So I might I may not be an expert in car hacking really, but I have a I have been active in car hacking bug bashes and also you know met most of the car hackers in the scene because of bug bashes and I thank Bug Route for that. So like I said, cars have IoT too or Internet of Things. So basically, that's another attack surface. So that's why we want to test on cars or, you know, play on it. So this is a sample screenshot that I got from the previous bug bash that we have last year. And we actually paid like 224,000 US dollars. And so what you can see, these are the researchers who did it. Uh, the top 10 and, you know, the the top one was able to earn 120 points for this bug bash. And it's really one of the, you know, it's one of the best thing to see car hackers totally hack a car or bypass something. And if you want to, like, dive into car hacking, you don't know where to start or you don't know um you know what to what to use what what tools do you need to use so what kind of like uh things that you can actually work on with some of the devices available so this is one of the best books that i could actually um advise so it's the car hackers handbook it's by Craig Smith, and there's a picture of him there. That's actually me and my friend, who is also one of the organizers of the Car Hacking Village in the Philippines. Uh, we gave him a shot for his talk. So, yeah, drink all the booze and hack all the things. Then, basically, Craig Smith in that book, he actually also posted or written the common attack surfaces in a car. So you have the cellular, you have the Wi-Fi, you have the Bluetooth, you have the TPMS or the tar pressure monitoring system. And then you have the key S. And then aside from the external things that you can do, you have the internal um, attack surfaces. So take, for example, the infotainment, the nav console, even the USB port. So the universal serial bus, that's also an attack surfaces. And then you have the OBD2 connector. So how do you usually find that? It's usually in the, um, at the bottom of the uh, steering wheel or maybe at the side. So it depends. So there, there are actually pictures that you can Google where, where you can find OBD2. But if you can't find that, how, how do you, you know, do CAN testing without having access to OBD2. So basically, maybe you could test some, some wires that are there externally for the car. Maybe you could rip off some of the sensors and then just grab a multi-tester and then check if it's traveling on 1.5 volts or 1.25 or, or over that. And if you see that it's traveling um, 
1.5 volts, for example, from one of the wires that you rip off, that means that there's scan in there. And in fact, there are many ways that you could attack from there. Maybe the brake lights, uh, open the door externally by just ripping off. So I can't divulge much of the uh, attacks that I was able to see in the bug bash, but you know, I will just share some insights about it. And you know, here's a graph. Uh, I just was able to grab this one from ArgusSec. And as what you can see, you have the air, uh, this is a more detailed attack surface of a connected vehicle. So you have the radio, the TCU, the transmission control unit, you have the ECU or the engine control unit, then you have the vehicle, the vehicle communication, uh, body controller, locks, lights, etc. OBD2. Basically, these are the most common as well. So it's more detailed. Then we'll head on to the next slide. So for bug crowd, because we have, you know, we have been involved with creating bug bashes. Not me, but bug crowd itself. I just, you know, triage issues in the bug bash. So basically we have these common classifications. We have the P1 for infotainment, if it's a PII leakage. And then we have, uh, if you could clone the key fob. So that's P1 as well. And then if you could pivot to the canvas with the infotainment, like you were able to execute arbitrary commands and then pivot from there, execute some CAN messages. So that we usually uh, reward that one as P2. And then P5 examples, we have the roll jam attacks, the replay attacks, and we have the uh, other attacks as well for the RF hub, the infotainment, and the can so if you uh, if you have like can injection you could dos the ecu for example so that's a p4 issue now you might you might uh you may not be able to see that there's other p1 from can here basically because we already have a vrt entry for authentication authentication bypass which is p1 so that's why um automatically if someone was able to you know use the uh security access control for cars like being able to bypass the firewall for a car or an sgw so that's automatically a p1 or an authentication bypass issue so that's why uh we just didn't add another one geared for cars because it would it would just sound uh, a duplicate entry for a VRT. So it was I who, together with Dax Labrador, who is a former ASE, who actually added this one. And Paul, Paul one of my teammates, Paul Powell, I mean, uh, he was the one who committed this one. So now, um, like I said, it's not just about the can. There are other attack surfaces that you could try in a, in a bug bash. So like I said, if you could bypass the authentication mechanism for security gateways or firewalls, so it's a P1, like you are not supposed to access that, um, that surface or like you were able to send a certain frame and then you were able to trigger the brake lights. You were able to train the brake sounds or the alarm, I mean the alarms of the car, not brake sounds, but alarms of the car. So that's a P1. And then if you are able to dump the boat bootloader for security gateways or firewalls, that's a P1 as well. And if you are able to program the ECU by by bypassing the gateway, that's still a P1. And then of course, because if it's a connected car, uh, it has some app, applications that you could download to sync with your car, right? So it varies. So if you have Android or iOS vulnerabilities, if you are good in mobile security, so here, here's, here's the thing that you could try as well. So if you don't have much knowledge in CAD, you could also dive into 
the mobile vulnerabilities that is connected to your, uh, uh, for an app that is connected to your car. So there was this uh, issue with Nissan Leaf before. It, it's fixed right now. So Troy Hunt and his friend actually, uh, basically, they were able to, you know, found out that you can actually control your uh, the Nissan Leaf car with an app and when they tried to when they tried to like sniff the app there's an endpoint wherein there is actually a certain endpoint that, that calls the VIN number of a car the VIN number of their car itself so if you are able to like figure out one of the VIN numbers of a Nissan Leaf, you could actually uh, control another car for them. So the fix for that is not the security issue of a VIN, but the end, but that endpoint, which doesn't, uh, which doesn't have authentication. So basically that's, that's an issue related to web vulnerabilities and a mobile app, because from that mobile app, they were able to discover that there's an endpoint that allows you to call any VIN numbers. So how, how, how was it able to, you know, access other cars? So because they have telematics module and then for web vulnerabilities again, so it could be connected to the cloud, the telematics, the firmware update server. So take, for example, what if the firmware update server has a, SQL injection vulnerability. So basically, it's going to be become a P1 issue. It's going to get the kind of rating that you have from the web vulnerabilities in the VRT or the vulnerability rating taxonomy. Anyways, um, I hope I'm not boring you. Here are some of the ins insights that I've actually found on the net and some of the demos that I've used are actually from my car itself as well. And, you know, I hope that you will try this and I hope you don't break the car. So try this at your own risk. Basically, in a BMW 330i, so if you name your phone to like percent %x, percent %x, percent %x, percent %x, and then connect your phone to a BMW 330i, so it will cause the infotainment to crash. It will brick your device. And thanks to this researcher, we know about this one. So this is an issue be, uh, between the Bluetooth stacks of the infotainment system. Next. And this actually from my car. So basically, if you have infotainment default creds, sometimes it's an issue, sometimes it, it isn't. But basically, we have a VRT for insecure transmissions. So what if you could prove to the program owner that, hey, one of your infotainment system allows me to tell that or you know, work with FTP. So basically, you have there that you can actually prove that there is insecure transmission on an infotainment. So that's possible it's possible that you can be rewarded for that and if you know the root password maybe you could pivot from there to interact with a can so if you have access to the uh, infotainment maybe you could like pivot to the system and then interact or send canned messages to your car i would say that that could become a p2 if you're able to do that like maybe Trip off the um, uh, the brake lights, or trip off the alarms, or the airbags. If you can do that, then yep. How about the P1 as well? This is from my car again. So because if you are not able to pivot, so this could become a P3. So if you're only able to execute arbitrary commands. Because, for example, if the system is like sandbox and you are not able to just, you know, send uh, canned messages, so basically, just just being able to 
execute arbitrary commands on the infotainment. So that's that's something that is P3. So I have a video actually about this one. And here. So this is the chicken that uh, the rooster that you keep on hearing actually. Oh wait, I think it's crashing, sorry. Not sure, but let me just. Can you guys still hear me? Ah, uh, yes, we can still hear you. Okay, uh, I think the Apple is causing a DOS, but I know, I mean, it's, the video lag, but let me try it again. Sorry for that one. Okay, uh, it's okay now. So this is the POC. Not sure why it's this is happening, but so we can we can link that on your Twitter and in the Discord after. And um, <laughs> okay. so for anyone watching this on the recording. Ship code. Uh, we'll have his Twitter at the, at the beginning or the end, um, and the link to this video will be in the comments on the video. Yeah, sorry about that one. Let me just close the QuickTime player again, and then, you know. Uh, here, it's working now. So basically, uh, I was able to insert a. You know, a flash drive on the car and then you know trigger command injection so, so let's just move this forward there you go and this is the i was able to execute the uh, name space minus a so that's if you can do that that's a P3, but if you could like move further, being able to send can messages, so it's a P2. Okay, let's present it again. Sorry for the technical difficulties a while ago. But so, like I said, um, ECU resets. You know, if you are able to do that bypass, so that's a P1 as well. And Chris Velasek and Charlie Miller has a book about advanced scan injection attacks, which could help. So there's a link on that. And then I don't have a POC about this one, but I was able to see. So I can't divulge other issues that were found in the bug bag for NDA purposes. But to help you with that, there's a tool that I love that allows you to, you know, fuzz something or like you know maybe get the seed key of the car there's a tool that i love really there's another one called yeah yet which is yet another car hacking tool uh, this one is my favorite because it's just a command line and basically i have a vm running right now so this is the carrying caribou so these are the things that you could do so if you run the test module of Caring Caribou, you could actually send this diagnostic services and then also fuzz the UDS. So if we try to, you know, um, run UDS discovery, so it will try to fuzz arbitration IDs. So this is just a virtual one because I'm running a UDS a server. So as what you can see, uh, it's trying to uh, send this can uh, this arbitration ID twenty four A, and then this is the can can I, uh, can frame, which is zero two one zero zero one, and there we got a request with seven DF seven E zero. And basically, we were able to send diagnostic session control to 710, which is the ID, 7DF. 
and 7e0. And if we do a CAN dump, my CAN dump is already running. So there, these are the arbitration IDs that we were able to send. And we got a response from 77EA arbitration ID. So 7107DF, 7EE0, those are the UDS that you can actually, um, you know, try. So there are other things that you could do. And in fact, uh, if you try UDS minus H, there's actually things that you could like security seed, ECU reset. So if you could do an ECU reset, then bypass the firewall. So that's a P1. So those are just, you know, tips and tricks with this tool. I'm going to do some demo later on, but here are the prerequisites for the demo. It's just a video, actually. I have an instrument cluster with NanoCan. Uh, I would like to thank Mincinet for actually teaching me how to, you know, how to solder this one and also how to uh, dev some uh, Arduino and then hook it up to fuzz my instrument cluster. So if you want to start car hacking, like if you don't want to buy the whole ECU pack, you can actually just buy an instrument cluster. It costs like $20, $20 $30, $40, $50. So it's car hacking on the cheap. And then if you get a nano can, we give it for free. Uh, if you find me in other in any conference, I actually give NanoCan PCBs. And then you just need to buy the uh, the parts like the Arduino Nano and the MCP2515 module. These are the tools from the right side of, of the pictures that I sent in the slide. So I have CanTac, I have STM32 Can Sniffer by TechMaker. So these guys are really good, the guys from TechMaker as well and the value can for from Intrepid control systems. So if you have a nano can and you have any SL can devices, just like the one that I flashed on the video. So you can actually try the demo that I will be demonstrating later on or showing. Also, there's a good resource that actually uh, it contains videos, presentations in DEF CON and other hacking conference, tools, open source libraries that you could start to learn car hacking. So I would definitely advise to read some of the links there or, you know, buy some of the tools that you get there. So Jay Gamblin or Jerry Gamblin also, uh, you know, created a VM machine that allow uh, that comes with pre-installed car hacking tools. So if you just want to have, if you have a Linux back box, so you just need to clone it if you don't want to install a VM machine. And if you want to use Metasploit, we could actually use Metasploit as well to test. Craig Smith actually dev modules to test car hacking and basically, so let me just get to my slide. So here are the automotive modules in Metasploit. And as what you can see, there's scan flood, there's scan probe, there's get vehicle information. And if we try to run can flood right now with my virtual, virtual can, because I'm using the virtual can just for demo purposes. I don't want to try this on the ECUs that I have. So let's try while I'm running the uh, can dump. So I'll try to run this one. So, and we have some of the things that it's actually doing. So if you are able to flood the bus and you can really see that there's a DOS you can actually do DOS. So that's something that we reward. And another old hack that we have, if you are able to write a while statement and then send can frames 
with zero, I mean, for example, the can frame is zero, 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 zero with eight bytes. And then you have the can ID or the arbitration ID as zero as well. It's possible that you could actually DOS the car as well because it will throw a lot of fault codes. So that's one of the things, old hacks. If, and if you're able to do that in a newer vehicle with a firewall, that's something that, you know, that is rewardable as well. So just tips and tricks. That's very cool, Jay. So we, uh, we're we running up up against time a bit here, unfortunately. So we might have to, uh, if, you've, yeah. if you've only got one or two slides left, we can we can watch those, but we might have to, to jump to Q&A. We've got a, got a few questions. <laughs> As well. Oh yeah, this is actually one of the fewer slides already. But basically, in the slide, I've already demoed this one. But here are the references and credits. And just one last video that I'm going to show. So here's the can in the middle in action. So I'm using Nano Can and CanTac to fuzz the cluster. So this is the nano can and then the can tap. Then they're fuzzing the cluster. So that's one of the things that I play with as well at home. And because we're running out of time, I'm sorry for taking a lot of time. So I'm ready for a QA. and a So I, sh I should just stop the sharing, right? Yeah, that's that's fine. If you want to yeah, end your screen share, we can jump okay. into Q&A. So personally, I found that absolutely fascinating. I've got a pretty big interest in cars myself. I'm more into modifications and, and that sort of stuff, but the CAN bus side of things is, is certainly fascinating. Um, one thing I was wondering though, uh, it, do, you, do car hackers look at non-OEM equipment? So um, maybe alarms and entertainment systems, like you've got Android entertainment systems available aftermarket now. And is that, is that the sort of stuff that, that car hackers look at also? Yes, yes. So basically, uh, they also like try to figure out how to attack the infotainment system, the Android head units. So if you could also find vulnerabilities for that, that's something that's rewardable. It depends on the scope of the program, but usually it's in the scope. Cool. Um, so there's obviously a lot of manufacturers that are now using CAN bus. I guess they're all using it these days, but is there any major difference between the manufacturers some are better or worse than others, or? Uh, that's actually a tricky question or interesting question. But I guess it's hard to answer and without revealing too much information, but yeah, that, speaking that, that's, generally, I suppose. That's the thing. So I can't, I can't really speak based on the NDAs that we have, but you know, there are differences, but uh, they use some standards like the CAN, the FlexRay, and then other uh, communication protocol that they use. CAN is one of the most common protocols, but there are other protocols that it's actually present. So, Is the, the CAN bus protocol unique to a manufacturer or is that based on a standard that's open and available? Well, for UDS, there, there are standards for that, but you know, it's unique, for example, take for example, for the instrument cluster, of Mazda. So the arbitration ID for turning the speedometer is 202. But for PG207, for example, it's, I think, 56B, if I'm correct, if I'm not, if I'm not wrong, but something like that. So it depends, actually. But in terms of UDS, like Unified Diagnostic Services, so they have the same, like getting the PID info getting the vehicle info so that's pretty much standard but you know uh accessing some functionalities with other endpoints so that's they have different uh arbitration ids mm, okay so there's obviously more autonomous vehicles and and that sort of thing being in development now is the attack surface of internally on one of those vehicles much larger than a than a standard internal combustion like a regular VW Golf, for example? Mm -hmm. I guess, again, yeah. can't talk about it too much, but in general? Yeah, a lot. So basically, if it had, 
uh, basically if it has telematics module, if it has more connections to the internet, the more attack surfaces. So V2V or vehicle to vehicle communication, more attack surfaces. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. All right, I think that wraps it up for our questions now. Um, but I think the, the I think it might be one or two we didn't get to. But if you could drop into the to the Discord uh, after this and and uh, maybe ask answer some questions in there, that would that would be yeah. very much appreciated. Yeah. Um, um, anyway, I would just like to give a warning. So I'm not an automotive security expert. So I just have like knowledge because of the things that I learned from bug bashes, from going to DEF CON, Car Hacking Village and learning this stuff. So uh, if I can't answer those questions all in all, I'm so, I apologize. <laughs> so, yeah. That's no problem but, at all. It's, it's, a, it's a fascinating area. It's, a, it's definitely gonna be an area that we need, we need people looking into cars, looking into the cars they've got and or maybe picking up an instrument cluster on eBay and, and playing around with it. Um, yeah. So certainly find those issues. Yeah. So for me, that's one of the best actually uh, thing. If you want an actual hard hardware, it's good to start with instrument clusters, like how to figure out with how to turn turn off the en uh, the engine light, so something like that. Turn on the speedometer. It's one of the most basic thing that you could do, and then try some uh, simulators as well. Like for example, the online. Uh, I mean the Virtual Instrument Cluster by Craig Smith, the UDS server, which is the one that I was running a while ago. So it's a good thing that you get a grasp of the basics of car hacking and CAN bus.